Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, this morning, we're going to be in Genesis chapter 25. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open them up to Genesis chapter 25. And this message is going to be the first in our series on the life of Jacob. This morning, I'm essentially going to give you kind of some of the backstory of Jacob, the story so far, so to speak. Because Jacob's background, like our backgrounds, are important. God has designed us in such a way as human beings that when we come into the world, we don't just suddenly appear out of nowhere in a vacuum, fully formed, fully developed. Rather, we come into the world in a context, into a family, into a location, into a time period. So Jacob's history affected his life just like our history affects our life. I remember when I first read the story of Jacob, or at least the first time I remember really reading about the story of Jacob, um, I was about 16 years old, I had just become a Christian, and my mentality at that time was that I felt like I was on a tightrope. I felt like I was walking really carefully on a tightrope. And on one side of the tightrope, there was the old man that I used to be before I knew Jesus. And then on the other side, all the way over there, there was the new person that Jesus was calling me to be. Uh, the person that I was destined to be in heaven, right? The person that I had to work really hard to become. That was my mentality at the time. Um, and I felt like I had to walk straight and steady and not fall. Otherwise, I would lose my inheritance uh, or God would stand against me. That was how I was thinking about things at that time. And above everything else, I had to push myself to keep improving, continue to improve myself. And what better way, I thought, to do that than to read the Bible? So I resolved, I made a New Year's resolution when New Year's Eve came around. I said, okay, I am going to read the entire Bible this year. So I started doing one of those Bible in a year plans, and it started off pretty well. I cranked through some pretty familiar stories, uh, did the, the creation, the fall, the flood, uh, Babel, Noah, all, the, all that familiar stuff. But then I remember reading about God coming to a guy named Abraham, and this is Jacob's grandfather. And he comes to Abraham, and he says, Abraham, I'm going to bless your family. I'm going to make a, out of your family, I'm going to make a huge nation, and your family, your nation family is going to be a blessing to all other nations. And Abraham seemed to be a pretty good guy. I mean, he said that Abraham was a man of great faith, and the Bible says that Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. He was such a, a man of faith that he was willing to sacrifice his only son, Isaac, or his only natural son, Isaac, uh, to, to God. He was willing to sacrifice Isaac to God because he knew that God could raise the dead. And Isaac, like his father, was also a person of faith. He trusted his God and he trusted his father when they went together to sacrifice him. In fact, the Bible says in Genesis 22, 8, that the two of them went together. A more literal translation of that could be, and the two of them went in agreement Isaac was going to allow himself to be sacrificed knowingly and willingly. And the phrase is repeated a couple times for emphasis. And of course, we know the rest of the story, that God later provided a lamb so that Isaac didn't have to be sacrificed. But the point is, Isaac also seems to be a pretty good guy. And then there's Isaac's wife, Rebecca. Isaac needed a wife, also a pretty cool story. Isaac needed a wife, so Abraham sent out a servant to go and find uh, a wife for his son. And when the servant finds Rebecca and tells her about Isaac, she, in faith, went with this relative stranger to marry a man who she had never met before. Rebecca's story is kind of a beautiful picture of what we do as the church. We, we go to Jesus despite the fact that we have never seen him before with our natural eyes. It's a wonderful example for us. But the Bible says Rebecca was barren, meaning she couldn't have any children. So she called out to God, uh, her and her husband both, and God intervened. And she miraculously had not one child, but two. She had twins. 
So all of these people so far seem like awesome examples for us as Christians. But then there was Jacob, the younger of those twins. And when I got to Jacob's life in my reading plan, I was really confused. Because so far, even though some of the previous people had sinned, they could all be called heroes of a kind, heroes in their own right. But Jacob, here, let me just read to you how Jacob came into the world. If you're able, would you please stand with me in honor of the reading of God's word? We're in Genesis chapter 25, starting in verse 19. God's word says, These are the generations of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham fathered Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah, the daughter of Bethuel the Aramean, of Pad Aram, the sister of Laban the Aramean, to be his wife. And Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife because she was barren, and the Lord granted his prayer, and Rebekah was conceived. The children struggled together within her, and she said, If it is thus, why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two people from within you shall be divided. One shall be stronger than the other. Uh, The older shall serve the younger. When her days to give birth were completed, behold, there were twins in her womb. The first came out red, all his body like a hairy cloak, so they called his name Esau. Afterward, his brother came out, of, came out with his hand holding Esau's heel. So his name they called Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Okay, so this is how our hero comes onto the scene. This is how Jacob comes onto the scene. In the womb, he is already fighting with his brother. Not a very well-behaved child. And this fighting is so intense that his mom actually starts praying. She's like, God, what is going on inside of me? This is, this is not uh, right, what's happening right now. And then when Jacob actually comes into the world, comes out of the womb, uh, he's grabbing his brother's heel. And this doesn't translate into English very well, but this was a, a turn of phrase. If you called someone a heel catcher at the time, it was like calling them a trickster or a con man uh, or a rascal or something like that. It was not a compliment to call someone a heel grabber. So Jacob comes out of the womb grabbing his brother's heel, fighting dirty, being a trickster. And then from that moment onwards, Jacob's entire life is marked by lies, by sin, by trickery, by theft, by sexual immorality, by deceit, all sorts of sins. I could go on and on and on. That's Jacob's life. But then we read in Exodus 6, 6, this is, how, this is what God says about himself. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham. Abraham's a cool guy. The God of Isaac, all right, and the God of Jacob. When I look at Jacob's life, and read that God calls himself the God of Jacob. God chooses to identify with this guy. I was very confused. Because up until this point, I had been reading the Bible as a book full of good examples. I had been reading the Bible because I needed people to help me walk across that treacherous tightrope. I read the Bible because I needed to know how to whip myself into shape how to work myself across that tightrope. I wasn't prepared for Jacob. So, relatively new Christian, I went to my pastor. I figured he would know better than me, so I I asked him, what gives? I, I probably sounded a little bit accusatory. I went up to him, pastor, I said, Pastor Smith, how can God identify himself with Jacob? Jacob was a jerk. And my pastor, he knew I was doing this reading plan, So he asked me, very lovingly, he asked me, Dan, did you really read the stories that came before Jacob? I mean, did you really read them? And as I was sitting there with him, he took me back, we went back together, and looked at all of those stories from creation to Jacob's birth. So let's just do that right now. The creation is a very familiar story to us. In the beginning, God gave humanity a mission and a test 
The mission was that humanity would uh, fill the earth with God's glory by having a bunch of children. And um, the test, on the other hand, was, that, was a test of obedience. Was humanity going to obey God in the world that he created, or was humanity going to choose to be their own God and not listen to them? We know how the story went. Uh, that we failed that test as humanity. Adam and Eve rebelled against God, and in doing so, they welcomed sin, suffering, and death into the world. Not exactly heroes, but God was faithful to them. He said to Eve that one of her descendants was going to crush the head of the serpent. We now know that descendant to be Jesus. But the story continues. <clears throat> Humanity had at one time only had the knowledge of good. Now they had the knowledge of both good and evil. So they had a choice to make. You're going to choose good or you're going to choose evil. And of course we know that humanity regularly, continually is choosing evil. Humanity is becoming exponentially more wicked over time <clears throat> until finally God sends the flood. God has had enough of humanity's wickedness. But God's promise to Eve still stands. So God chooses to save the human race through a family, through Noah's family. It says that Noah found favor in the eyes of God. And Noah did have faith in God, but if we look at Noah's life, we see that there was some significant sin areas in his life, <clears throat> um, especially in regards to his family relations. So, maybe Noah wasn't as much of a hero as I thought he was either. After the flood, God again tells humanity to fill the earth with his glory, with more people. So they have children, and society begins to grow. But humanity again chooses to be their own God. They rebel against God this time by staying in one place rather than spreading out. And in honor of their rebellion, they build this tower, the Tower of Babel, to show off how great they are. And at that time, everyone spoke the same language. So God, as a judgment on them, he confused their languages and then spread them out <clears throat> over all the earth, which incidentally was exactly what he asked them to do in the first place, to spread out. So in the face of humanity's rebellion, God still achieves his purposes. <clears throat> So those scattered families eventually become nations or tribes, and then those tribes become nations, and then those nations forget the name of the Lord. Instead of remembering the God who made them, the God who created them, they create their own gods, gods that are more comfortable to them. But God still pursued humanity. So God chooses one family that's going to become one nation, and his intention with this family was that they would welcome all the other families, all the other tribes, all the other nations back into right relationship with God again. It's this understanding that God gives to Abraham. God comes to Abraham and says, Abraham, your family is going to be the one. I'm going to give you a son. And Abraham, though he does have faith and does some admirable things, Abraham also often doubted God. He doubted that God could protect him. Twice we have recorded that Abraham abandoned his wife by lying that he had ever been married to her, and he did it to protect himself. Abraham also doubted that God would allow his wife to conceive naturally, to naturally have children. So Abraham and his wife Sarah try to force God's will to happen by using one of Sarah's slaves as a surrogate mother. Maybe Abraham wasn't the hero I thought he was either. Isaac, though he was willing to sacrifice his life as a teenager, turned out to be a terrible father. We'll read more about this, but he, had a, he, he played favorites. He definitely preferred his older son over his younger son, and he made no effort to hide that favoritism, and his children suffered for it. And Isaac was also willing to go against God's will and give more to his older son than he was supposed to. And then, there was Jacob. But this time, I could see a more complete picture of Jacob's background. This is where Jacob came from. He was born into a broken family, 
into a fallen world, just like us, his background would have been affected, or he would have been affected a lot by his background. Though while there is some good things to say about Jacob's grandfather, Abraham, and about his father, Isaac, there is nothing good to say about Jacob. Jacob's story is really about Jacob's constant failure. Many of us, when we look at the Bible, we expect to find a bunch of stories about good people being faithful to God and being nice to each other. I know that was my expectation. We expect all the people in this book to be good and godly examples to follow, but when we actually read this thing, we find people like Jacob. And I've heard people be upset when they come across the sin that God's people engage in, especially in God's word. In fact, Jacob's story in particular has actually been a subject of some controversy recently. There was a book that was made into a TV show a few years ago that was fairly popular. And I don't recommend this show at all, but essentially the premise of the show is that Christians have taken over the government and have created a dystopian society. This society uses young women as breeding stock for wealthy men whose wives can't have children. This is a, a really troubling, horrible premise. These are terrible things that are depicted in this TV show. But the author, who's not a Christian, she said that she got the idea for that from the Bible, from something that Jacob actually did. And we'll, we'll later learn that Jacob uses his wife's slaves as surrogate mothers, because one of his wives couldn't have children. This was something common in the culture at the time, and these female slaves likely had no choice in the matter. And being used in that way would have affected them for the rest of their lives. After being used like that, they weren't allowed to marry ever again. This was a terrible act of abuse towards women. Seeing them as essentially property <clears throat> to be used as to bear someone else's children. So this author read this story about Jacob and said, if a Christian is going to take the Bible seriously, then they should see this horrible abusive act as okay if they're going to be consistent. And then she wrote a whole book about what we as Christians should be okay with. What this author has failed to do is differentiate between things that the Bible describes and things that the Bible prescribes. Describes versus prescribes. So before we get too deep into any biblical narrative, it's very important to understand the difference between description and prescription in the Bible. Understanding this difference will not only help us in the sermon series, but also in our personal devotional time as we're trying to apply biblical stories to our own life. So first, let's look at description. Description. Description is very common in narratives of the Bible. This pretty much includes every Old Testament narrative. And what description is, is teaching that something did happen. Teaching that something did happen. <clears throat> it's describing the facts. It's telling the story, telling the true story of what happened. On the other hand, we have prescription. Prescription is God's word telling us what we should do. Most of the letters in the New Testament are prescriptive. The Old Testament law that told Jewish people how they should live their lives in a largely Gentile world um, was prescriptive. Prescriptive is teaching that something should happen. As we're reading the Bible, we have to be careful not to confuse description for prescription. In other words, we should not make the narrative the normative. <clears throat> so we shouldn't read these stories, these biblical descriptions of fact, and assume that they are stories that we are meant to emulate. Assume that we're supposed to play copycat for the characters in the story. God does want us to learn from these stories. We have them for a reason. They were written for our benefit. But learning from a story does not necessarily mean doing exactly what a character in a story does. For example, 
God put the story of David and Goliath in the Bible. It's a fairly familiar story. We know it. Uh, Goliath speaks blasphemies against God, and David is going to defend God's honor. So he gets a, a rock, and he puts it in a sling, and he throws the rock, and he hits David right between, or Goliath right between the eyes, and Goliath drops down dead. Fairly familiar story. And we can learn a lot from that story. We can learn about trusting God. We can learn about caring about our languages, or our language, the language that we use, and how we talk about God. Uh, but one thing we should not learn from the story of David and Goliath is if you want to be a good Christian, you have to throw rocks at people. That's a bad application of the story of David and Goliath. That's confusing description for prescription. The same is true in Jacob's story. When we see Jacob's constant failure, when we see all of his faults, when we see all of his flaws, we should not see these sins as good things that should have happened. They were not good things. But they are real things. They did happen. Some people will reject the Bible because these stories exist. They want a book full of nice, inoffensive people who did nothing but good things. But in the real world, we find people like Jacob. People really who are just like us. People who are hypocrites. People who are liars. People who are tricksters. People who deceive other people. People who are horribly, horribly flawed. So don't be shocked, friend, when you read the true stories of the Bible and find some pretty messed up things in there. Because the Bible tells the true story. We're meant to learn from the stories in the Bible, both the success stories and the stories of failure. And in Jacob's life, we see a lot of failure. We see a lot of flaws. We see broken family. We see pride. We see envy. We see idolatry. We see deception. We see presumption. But above all of that, Christian, we see the faithfulness of God. So while the story of Jacob is about Jacob's constant failure. It's also about God's constant faithfulness. Which means that really, Jacob's story, as uncomfortable as it makes us, is really the story of all of human history. Think of Abraham as sinful as he was. God kept his promise to him. God made Abraham's family a great nation. And God made Abraham's family a blessing to the world. Jesus is the greatest blessing that this world has received. And Jesus came from Abraham's family. Isaac, even though Isaac failed terribly as a Bible, not as a Bible, as a father, Isaac failed terribly as a father, the Bible says in Hebrews 11 verse 20, by faith, Isaac invoked future blessings on Jacob and Esau. As flawed as a father as Jacob was, Isaac was, excuse me, as flawed as a father as Isaac was, God still blessed his children, not because of his flaws, but in spite of them. And then when we get to Jacob, Jacob's story just like his dad's story, just like his granddad's story, just like my story, just like your story, is the story of flawed people and a faithful God. So as we're looking at Jacob's life, this is what we're going to be highlighting, that no matter how flawed you are, God is constantly faithful. Why does that matter? Why does it matter that you are constantly flawed? Why does it matter that God is constantly faithful? What are we supposed to do about that? First, we have to acknowledge our flawed nature. Before we can get about solving a problem, we have to acknowledge that we have one. Recognize that you are flawed, broken, and depraved. I'm sure that everyone in this room can think of many flaws in their own life. Imperfections, sins, things that they wish were not a part of them. And if you can't, at least we can say you struggle with pride, maybe. <laughs> but here is my confession to you all. I am flawed. 
deeply flawed beyond anything that I can do to fix it. I agree with God about this fact. My prayer is that he would help me. My only hope is that he would help me, that he would cleanse me, that he would carry me day by day. I can't walk on that tightrope by myself without falling. The only way that I can do it is if God is constantly guiding me and supporting me. The only way that I can even hope to stand on that tightrope. And friend, the same is true of you. There is not a single person here who can walk on that tightrope without falling, without failing utterly. Once you've acknowledged your flawed nature, once we have acknowledged our flawed nature, then we can give up trying to save ourselves. Reading about the life of Jacob destroys any thought we have in our heads of try to be like Jacob. Let's be like Jacob. There is no way to read Jacob's story and think, oh man, this guy would be great if he just tried a little harder. The beauty of Jacob's story is that his story is our story. God has not chosen to save the world through perfect superhero human beings. Rather, God has chosen to use flawed people like us, like every single person in this room, to point people back to his son, Jesus Christ, his perfect son, Jesus Christ. He's chosen to use flawed people. Now, don't hear me saying, stop pursuing righteousness. That's not what I'm saying at all. Do pursue righteousness, but stop trying to pursue it in your own strength. As you're walking towards glory, as you are pushing on towards heaven, tie yourself to Jesus Christ. Because Jesus is the only one who has ever walked on that tightrope without failing, without falling, without even stumbling, without even leaning in one direction. Picture this. Imagine you and Jesus walking on a tightrope close to each other. He is totally straight, not falling at all, just moving straight across. And you, on the other hand, are shaking the whole time, barely even able to stand up by yourself. You you can barely even inch forward, leaning back and forth, stumbling, and eventually falling. Well, friend, if you aren't tied to Jesus, there's no hope to get back up. But if you are tied to him, It's no issue for him at all to reach down and pull you back up and put you back down. And the Bible teaches that Jesus is the only person who can get us to the other side. So let him be your anchor. So that when you do stumble, so that when you do fall, so that when you do fail, you can trust in him to be your savior. Give up trying to save yourself but instead trust in Jesus as your Savior today. (laughs) Trust in Jesus as your Savior tomorrow and the next day. Trust in Jesus as your Savior forever. I'm not saying you have to be saved multiple times. That's not what I'm saying. But I am saying you have to daily entrust yourself to your Savior, your friend, Jesus. Give up trying to save yourself. And lastly, embrace the gospel of grace. We are flawed, like Jacob. We can't hope to save ourselves any more than Jacob could. We can't hope to get ourselves into heaven by working a little harder because all of our good works are going to fall short of the holiness, of the glory of God. So what are we supposed to do? We actually find an answer in Genesis 28, something that God says to Jacob. Genesis 28, 15. God says to Jacob, Behold, I am with you wherever you go and will keep you wherever you go. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. God made a promise to Jacob. Like he did to Jacob's grandfather. Like he did to Jacob's father. God was going to fulfill that promise to Jacob's family. 
And here's the kicker. Jacob couldn't do anything to earn that blessing. In a similar way, God has made a promise to each and every one of us. If you are in Jesus, God has promised to bring you out of guilt and into glory, out of hell and into heaven, out of bondage and into freedom. God has made some amazing promises to us, church. And the bummer is, we have nothing to offer in exchange. But God, in his grace, is faithful to do exactly as he promised. This was true for Jacob, and child of God, it's true for you. So friend, embrace the gospel of grace. Recognize that you never earned God's favor, that you can never earn your own salvation, but God gives it to you anyway. I know, I know that feels uncomfortable. I know that I don't like to receive unmerited or unearned help. I can think of an example from my time at Wheaton in college when I was in a class and I twisted my knee the wrong way and then all of a sudden my patella, my knee, my kneecap was over here instead of being over here. Um, This might have happened for some of you. It's not particularly comfortable. Uh, But instead of going to the hospital, like my wife strongly recommended, I went to Walmart. Um, (laughs) Because I was going to get a knee brace. I was going to fix this problem myself. I was going to go get a knee brace at Walmart in the pharmacy section. But I wasn't stupid. I brought a friend. I brought a friend. And he was, uh, if if I really needed it, he could help me. Um, And I could tell as I was walking into Walmart with this friend that he was looking at me like... And he asked me, actually, Dan, do you, want, do you want to lean on me for a second here? Do you want some help? And I said, no, absolutely not. I'm fine. And as I'm walking, my knee is like a slip and slide in here, moving back and forth. But I'm a man. I can, like, power through this thing. And we're walking through the Walmart pretty fast. And he's like, Dan, do you want to slow down a little bit? And now that he said that, I definitely can't. No, I'm fine. We can just keep going here. I was going to tough it out on my own. I was unwilling to receive grace. Because I wanted to fix things myself. My my want to be self-sufficient, my pride, my independence would not allow me to rely on anyone but myself. And a lot of the times that's exactly how we are when it comes to receiving grace from our God. We would rather walk across that tightrope on a janky knee than have to lean on Jesus. But leaning on Jesus is exactly what we need. And all we have to do to receive that is accept it. God is offering that grace constantly, and that's all we have to do is accept it. Not just once for salvation, but every single day as we press on to look more like Jesus. We are a flawed, flawed people. But praise the Lord that we serve a faithful, faithful God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we praise you for that fact. That you are faithful even when we are unfaithful. That you have given us blessings beyond what we could possibly hope to imagine. You gave us that for nothing. I pray that this morning we would acknowledge that we are flawed, that we are faulty. I pray that this series would help us to do that, to recognize that we don't measure up. But like Kevin said this morning, God, I pray that that would not discourage us, that that would not crush us. Because though we can't help, we can't hope to save ourselves, You've given us grace. You've given us everything that we need. We come to you empty-handed, but not forsaken. You have pursued us since the beginning of creation. So God, as we live as human beings who feel like we need to earn everything that we receive, I pray that we would give that to you. That we would give that up. That we would surrender and accept the immeasurable, unimaginable grace that you have offered us. 
I ask all these things in the name of Jesus and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.